Okay, we'll see how long my voice lasts. I'm tearing out our carpet in the basement and um, I'm taking out, I took out a door over the weekend and finished putting in a new French door. So we're taking out the carpet and re-leveling the basement floor, doing some painting, some other things. So all that dust is, my voice really hurts and I'm, it's gonna last till 11 o'clock. So we'll see if it, we'll see if some coffee helps it. So what we wanna do today is we wanna finish up our discussion of the things to do. We wanna look at some things to avoid And we'll go, uh, go over some graphing. So let's kind of review what we had looked at uh, last time. So we had these things to do, these ideas that we wanted to keep in mind. All right? And we had things like opportunity cost. Bless you. We had things like uh, people economize. We said, uh, what was the other stuff we said? Incentives, alter people's behavior. We said marginalism was important, right? Looking at the marginal benefits versus the marginal costs. Our fifth one was on information. Right, we said information was important, but it was costly to obtain. And so what we want to look at today is basically number six and number seven. So number six here. Economic actions can generate long-run effects that are vastly different from the short-run effects, right? So in other words, when we're engaging and we're doing stuff and we pass policies, we can get results in the long run that are a whole lot different than what we actually intended in the short run and actually can be more detrimental in one way uh, than what we had originally started. So let's look at a couple of different examples. <clears throat> The Federal Aviation Administration is considering uh, laws or regulations on children under the age of two. Okay, so currently, here's the way that it works, right? When you get on an airplane and you have a child that's less than two years old, that child does not have to have a seat. They can sit on your lap, okay? Now, why do you think they would be interested in making, they're thinking about changing this so that the child under the age of two also has, also has to have their own seat? Why do you think they would be interested in that? Do what? Cost more. Well, they don't have anything to do with costs. They're not the airlines. So it's not, it has nothing to do with making people buy extra seats. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? The whole idea behind it is safety, right? The idea being that just like in a regular car, right? If you have your child in your lap, and the car hits another car, there's no way you can keep the child with you. I mean, the car, the, the kid is going to go, right? 
The whole idea here is the same thing, right, with the airlines. You don't want little babies flying around the cabin, hitting people in the back of the head and hurting them, right, because that's going to be bad for the child and for the adult. Forget the fact the plane's crashing into the ground from six miles in the sky at 600 miles an hour, right? Nobody's going to survive anyway. But irrespective of that, that's the idea. Now, let's think about that. Because making your child buy a seat actually does make what go up. She just said it. The cost, right? So if we have an increase in costs to fly, how might people respond to that? So what would they do? Drive. Drive. And what's safer, driving or flying? Flying. Flying is safer than walking. Did you guys know that? It is the safest form of transportation. It is safer than walking. So what we have done is we have, in the guise of safety, and this is what they're thinking about doing, in the guise of safety, what they're thinking about doing is they're going to take people out of the airplane, which is very safe, put lots of kids into cars which are relatively unsafe and actually cause probably more people to get killed in the car than they would in the plane. Here's another example since we're on cars. We have our corporate average fuel economy standards. What these say is that when an automaker is selling cars, the average fuel economy of the fleet has to meet a certain level. Okay? So let's assume it's 25. It's not 25, but let's assume that it is. 25 miles per gallon. And in essence, what we want to do is we want to sell this other car. This other car gets, say, uh, 15 miles per gallon, which means every single time I sell one of these guys, a 15 mile per gallon car, I've got to sell another car that gets how many miles per gallon? Exactly. Right? Because 35 and 25, the average is 25. 15 and, and uh, 35. Average out to 25. Now, if they don't reach this standard, the fines are quite substantial. Right? So the fines, you know, if they are at 24.9 miles per gallon, the fine is X number of dollars times however many cars they sold, all of the cars that they sold, right? So they have an incentive to ensure that they reach this standard. So how can we get cars to have 35 miles per gallon rather than, say, 15 or 25 miles per gallon? What can we do? How would we get this? That's one way. Relatively easy or relatively hard? It's, yeah, it's hard, right? If it was easy to make the engine more efficient, they would have already done that. How can you make the car have an increase in, in, ga in miles per gallon easily? Make the car lighter, so you make them out of plastic, and make them Smaller. That's the easy way, right? The car I drove when I was in college was a 1978 Buick LeSabre. It was all steel. There wasn't any plastic in there. 
And in fact, when you're goofing off and stuff and you accidentally back into somebody or you're back into a pole or something, it's the pole in the building that gets damaged, not my car. Right? Today's cars, the bumpers are made out of plastic. Right? And they're a whole lot smaller. My whole fraternity could fit into my Buick LeSabre. Hey, let's all go to so-and-so. All 120 guys jump in. <laughs> we all go. All right? So, let's think about this here for a second. Small little tiny light car made out of plastic that's really, really tiny is driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour, runs into Ford F-150, also going 70 miles an hour. Who's going to win? Ford F-150. And in fact, economists have figured out, using things like regression analysis and things like that, that the corporate average fuel economy standards are responsible for approximately 2,000 deaths per year from auto accidents. Right? It changes the structure of cars on the road enough. And you can sit there and you can analyze the accidents and who is driving these cars and why they're driving these cars. And you can say, we figured out that there's about 2,000 people that die every single year on the highways is because of the corporate average fuel economy standards. It puts people into really small, really light cars. And interestingly enough, it's not, if you would think to yourself, okay, well, just get rid of the Ford F-150s, make them all small, light cars. And the small, light cars, hitting small, light cars kills people. Small light cars and big heavy cars kills people. Big heavy cars, big heavy cars tends to not kill as many people. Right? So it's not a matter of, oh, get rid of all of these and put everybody in this. That doesn't help either. Right? So we have these long run effects that can be vastly different from the short run effects. Right? I mean, this guy right here is directly related to safety. We want to ensure that kids under the age of two don't die. We're actually making people die. We want to ensure that we have fuel economy standards because we had an oil embargo in the 70s, right? And in essence, what you get is you get about 2,000 people a year dying. These long-run effects can be vastly different from the short-run effects, right? Because what have they done? They've done things like they have changed incentives. People are economizing. What's the opportunity cost of this stuff? Okay. Number seven. Value is subjective, right? We cannot go out and objectively measure value. You can't do that. If I think my house is worth $300,000, there's really only one way to know if my house is worth $300,000, and what is that? to see if somebody's going to buy it. I can't just go out and say, this house is worth $300,000. One of the things that I think is really, really interesting, when you buy a house, you have an appraisal, and the appraisal person comes out and says, yes, this house is worth this, or yes, this house is not worth that. And I've never really actually understood the purpose of that. Because if you have a buyer that is willing to pay $300,000 for the house, then by definition, the house is worth $300,000. That's what that means, right? And in essence, and I understand the idea behind the appraisal. The idea behind the appraisal is that, look, if you don't make your payments, the bank wants to ensure that if they take possession of your house, they can sell it to somebody else. But in essence, what they're saying is that, yeah, sure enough, we're thinking that your house is worth this much. Well, of course it is. Somebody's willing to pay that. There's another way to think of this, right? There's a woman by the name of Julia, and she calls her name Butterfly. Hill. So you guys know what she's famous for, and you probably don't. She's from my age. She lived in a tree for two years out in California. Why do you think she would do that? Do what? Some sort of point. 
she was making a point, what would that point be? No. It, it was, in essence, it was private property. It was a lumber company, and the lumber company was eventually going to turn the tree into lumber. They're going to cut it down. And she didn't want the tree to cut down. She didn't think the tree should be cut down. And so she lived in the tree thinking, of course, that they can't cut the tree down while I'm up there. That would be really, really bad for public relations, and she would be right, right. So she lived in this tree for two years out in California so that they wouldn't cut it down. She actually even named the tree. She called it Luna, all right? And she had people come out there, and she would lower down a bucket, and they would give her food, and she'd bring it back up. And, of course, when she's going to the bathroom, she just goes to the bathroom. And she lived in this tree for two years, right? Eventually, the, the company says, fine. Come out of the tree, we promise not to cut down Luna and all the trees within 100 yards around it. Okay, just get out of the darn tree. So she comes down out of the tree, yeah, one, blah, blah, blah. How much is that tree worth to her? A, a, a lot, right? Would you guys live in a tree for two years? No, right? What is the opportunity cost of her living in a tree for two years? Two years pay, right? Two years worth of relationships with normal people, right? Rather than owls and grubs and things like that, right? So you can't say to yourself, the tree doesn't have value because the, the tree clearly does have value. Somebody was willing to, in essence, sacrifice two years of their life, right? In essence, to save this tree. So. We cannot objectively measure value. Value is what somebody is willing to pay. Interestingly enough, of course, because she lived in the tree for two years and went to the bathroom for two years, the tree actually died. So, but that's, I guess that's beside the point. She actually ended up killing the tree. But whatever. Some of her friends tried it, too, on some other trees. And then they found out that gravity can really suck, if you know what I mean. That's, that's a true story. Okay, so let's look at things to avoid. First thing we want to avoid is violation of the idea of Ceteris Paribus. So teres paribus here means everything else equal. Okay. In other words, when we're looking at changes, we want to make sure that we're only looking at one thing changing at a time. So let's look at an example. Let's suppose we've got a field. And this field gives us 100 bushels of wheat. Okay? And then next year, we apply 10% more fertilizer and 10% more pesticide. And we get 130 bushels. How much of those extra bushels are from the fertilizer and how much are from the pesticide? We don't know. Exactly. Let's assume that the year after that, we just put on 10% more fertilizer. And we get, say, 110 bushels. 
What can we say now? Can we say that? No. What can we say for sure? The fertilizer added 10. Why can we not say the 10% in the pesticide added 20? There's two things that are changing, and it's possible that the fertilizer and the pesticide are also interacting with each other, right? The only way for us to know how much the additional pesticide is is to have one that is only pesticide. Now what can we say? Yep, we can say, what else? Mm -hmm. And we can say one more thing. Ten percent more fertilizer gives ten percent more bushels, right? When we're looking at these changes, we can only have one thing changing at a time. If we have a whole bunch of different things changing, we, it's difficult to say how much of this change, how much of what we're seeing here, $300,000 for my house, or corporate average fuel economy, or people not flying and driving, how much of that is coming from just the change that is occurring, right? We have to be able to isolate those changes. And that can be difficult to do. But it's something that you have to try to do, right? We want to look at only one thing changing at a time. Second thing we want to avoid is introducing bias. Why would we want to avoid that? What type of economics would that be? You got a 50-50 chance of guessing right. No. What kind would that be? Positive or normative. So if we introduce bias, what are we doing? Normative, right? Normative economics is by definition opinion, and that's in essence what bias is. Let's look at a couple of different examples here. We've got two different stocks. These are real stocks. This is not made up. Okay, here's the first one. Okay. Got that idea in your mind what that guy looks like? Here's the second one. Which stock would you rather buy, the first guy or the second guy? First guy, right? These are, in essence, the exact same thing. This is actually the Dow Jones Industrial Stock Average. And you can see over here he starts here at 11,500 and he goes to 7,500. What's this guy doing? Twelve thousand, all the way down to zero. All right. 
And you can see that these guys are the same. You can line them up. There you go. See, that's pretty good. So we've got this guy right here. He matches that guy. Here's these two guys. There they are right there. Here's these three guys. There they are right there. Here's this guy here. See that flat part there? There he is. Comes down here. There's that guy. There's that guy. There's that guy. All right. All I did was change the scale of the graph. And by changing the scale of the graph, I made one guy look worse than the other guy. Right? No, it's the same. This is the same. This guy shows, this guy is doing this, right? He's relatively flat to here, right? And then has a small little dip, right? What's happening here with this guy? When you look at this guy, what do you say to yourself? This is a good investment or this is a bad investment? This guy is going all the way from here to here, right? And in fact, I mean, you can actually show it. I mean, you can show that this guy, here's this guy right here. He's going, he's starting at this point right here, and he's headed to this guy, right? So can we see that if we keep him going? That's what he's doing, right? Generally speaking. This guy's going from here and he's ending here, right? If this guy keeps going on, he's going to wind up here, right? Which rate of descent is higher? Is is higher? Is worse? It's clearly this guy. But it's the same thing. All you did was change the scale. By changing the scale, you made one thing look worse than the other, or one thing look better than the other. Do we need another example? Are you guys not convinced? Let's look at some more examples. Here's the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Let's look at uh, uh, let's look at uh, national employment rates.
usually it's this guy right here that's not enabled. I have to use that one. So let's see if they changed it. Okay, here's the labor force participation rate. We'll understand a little bit more what this means when we start talking about um, unemployment and employment, things like that. Okay. So here's this guy. You guys got this guy in your head. Let's download him as Excel. Okay. And let's go ahead and make a chart. So here's this guy's going from 1948 to here. We're going to insert. Uh, that's not what we want. I want a line. Okay. Here's our guy right here. Let's do the exact same thing again. guy all the way down. Okay. There's the labor force participation rate. How does that look? Pretty steady. That's what I would say too. What about this guy? Steady? No. Different from the other guy, right? Here it is for black males. Or is this just blacks? Oh, no, we want black males. Um, back. You let me know if you see it. Uh, here we go, right here. This will be a good one. Download. Excel data. Open with. Enable editing. Okay. Let's change the scale here to uh, 
let's change this guy to 80. Let's change the, or strike that. Let's change that guy to 65. Change this guy to 80. Okay. What's that guy doing? He's decreasing. He's going down. A whole bunch? Looks like it to me. What about now? Pretty He's pretty steady. A slight decline, maybe, but not that bad. I haven't changed the data at all. I want this data to show that the labor force participation rates for African males has fallen off a cliff. Does that show that? No. Oops. That guy does. In fact, it's so low it doesn't even show up the rest on the graph. That's how bad it is, right? Horrible, all right? Same data. I just made it show something completely different. Here's another example. It seems to exist. How to measure the class gap in reading. Okay, I'm going to read you part of what this says. Call it the reading income gap. Children from low income households average 25 hours of shared reading time with their parents before starting school, compared with 1,000 to 1,700 hours for their counterparts for middle income homes. Okay? These oft-repeated numbers originate in a 1990 book by Marilyn Adams titled Beginning to Read, Thinking and Learning about Print. Okay? So here's what this says. Did you guys, as parents, read to you? Maybe they did, maybe they did. Right? What this guy says is this. She's saying, look, I've done some studies, and I have shown that people from low-income households HH is my abbreviation for households. These people from low-income households, their parents read to them from the time they're born till the time they are going into kindergarten, they get 25 hours of reading. Their parents read to them 25 hours in the course of five years. Five hours a year, right? The middle income Households, they do this 1,000 to 1,700, right? So if it's 1,000 hours, let's just make it 1,000. Okay. There's no way I'm wearing nice clothes again with these double sided markers. So it's just, I'm going to start showing up in yucky clothes. Those are going to get all over me. Um, let's look at our calculator here. Where do you do the search at again on this? Oh, here we go. So here's 1,000 hours, right? Divided by 5, 200 divided by 365, 54, 30 minutes a day, something like that, right? If you're doing 1,700. Divided by five, they're reading 340 hours a year, 
divided by 365, right? 0.93 times 60, 55 minutes a day. That's what that guy says, right? Clearly, if you're getting read to 55 minutes a day from age zero all the way up to age five when you go into school, are you going to be a better reader, Ceteris Paribus, or a worse reader? A better reader, Ceteris Paribus, right? Keeping everything else constant, you're going to do better in school, right? Does anyone disagree with that? Think, no, that's stupid. If you parents read to you, you'll do worse in school, everything else constant. So here's these numbers, right? So she says, okay, these low-income households read to their kids 25 hours from zero to five, middle income 1,000 hours. Right? These oft repeated numbers originated in a 1990 book by Marilyn Adams titled Beginning to Read, Thinking About Learning in Print. Mrs. Adams got the 25 hour estimate from a study that she did of 24 children in 22 low income households. So you say to yourself, where does this number come from? 22 households. For the middle income figures, she extrapolated from the experience of a single child, her then four-year-old son, John. Do you think there might be a little bias here? Yeah. And in fact, interestingly enough, when you read about this, uh, these two numbers, like these, can per, uh, persevere in advocacy material, right? No major group opposes childhood reading or argues that children from low-income households uh, shouldn't have a level playing field, right? I mean, the, her book here was used... People read this book and said, oh my gosh, this is horrible. We have to do stuff. We're going to change public policy and rearrange dollars and spending and things like that to fix this problem. And I'm not saying that low-income households don't read to their children more or less than middle-income households. I don't know. And I'm not saying that reading to your kids is bad. It's, it's good. The problem is, is that you have introduced bias here. All right? Here's another example. Several years ago, I lived in Georgia. When I was living in Georgia, they had a giant um, forest fire near us. Or actually, was, I guess it was out in Colorado. So they had this giant wildfire out in Colorado. And the reason that I remember this is because it was on the news constantly. I mean, it was just constantly on the news. It never went away. It was on the news 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And by the time this thing was all said and done, they had burned out about 11,000 acres. I was thinking to myself, wow, 11,000 acres, that's, that's really bad. And then I got to thinking about it, and I said, because it's on the news all the time. It was literally 24 hours a day. I was like, I wonder how, many, I wonder how much area that is, 11,000 acres. And you've got about 640 acres in a square mile. Which means this guy right here is approximately 17 square miles. And of course, as you guys know from sixth grade math, fifth grade math, If you have a box four by four miles in size, this guy right here is 16, right? So this box right here would be like 4.1, something like that. And this guy right here is approximately 17. Now the information wasn't incorrect. 11,000 acres did burn. But what sounds sexier, 11,000 acres burning or a box four miles by four miles burned in Colorado? You see what I'm saying? 
Is this interesting? You guys been to Colorado? It's a big state. Missouri's a big state. A box four miles by four miles of wildfire in Missouri burned. I mean, when you're driving in your car from this point to this point on the road, you pass it in four minutes, right? And you're driving along, you're having a conversation with your friend, four minutes later, you're done. And then turn and go four minutes the other way, that box, that's what burnt, right? And that's what was in the news for all that week. It must have been a really slow news week. Because this sounds really, really sexy. It's like, oh my gosh, we've got to do something. And the whole world's coming to an end. This right here is like, who cares about that? Why are you talking incessantly about this? Blah, 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 blah. Right. We'll pick it up from there on uh, Wednesday.